And to think that some would suggest that our Lord is going to drag his bride through that time is an insult to his goodness, his character, his love, his faithfulness, his promises. That he said, we are not appointed unto wrath, but unto salvation. know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Greetings in the precious, most exalted name, heaven and in earth, now and for all of eternity, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, Yahshua HaMashiach. And welcome to another End Times for the Believers Bible Prophecy Update. I am reading from one of the most poetic representations of the rapture of the church throughout Old and New Testament alike. From the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. He standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Never in my entire life have I ever seen so much, spiritually speaking, forensic evidence that we are living in the last of the last days, as I see today? And in our portion of Scripture, we are given reference to a time frame. It speaks to us of a season, of a period of time in life that I believe focuses upon our departure. Once again, in regard to season or time frame, verse 11, for lo, the winter is past, the rain is over. The flowers, verse 12, appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. And verse 13, the fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with their tender grapes give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Would you join with me for a moment of prayer? Dear Father, each week I become more mindful of the fact that there are those who you love who turn to this program each week and need a word of encouragement, need a word of instruction. And I pray that that word will flow this day through my humble soul and glorify your name as I speak your words. Lord, we don't want, I don't want to, to hear the voice of myself nor do your people need to hear the voice of a man. They need to hear your voice, the voice of God Almighty. So be so gracious this day, Heavenly Father, and cause your word to be heard. In the mighty, exalted name of your Son, I pray, the Lord Jesus Christ, amen and amen. 
Like the springtime through various different events or dynamics announces its arrival through flowers and birds and fragrances so that the signs of the time are obvious when spring comes. So it is with our day in which we live. So many signs of the times which speak to us that this is the season, that the winter is over, that the springtime has accomplished its goal, and the watering of the garden, and summer is just beyond the horizon, and the word of the Lord speaks to us that these are moments to look up. From a geopolitical point of view, governments, the unelected oligarchs who serve as unelected kings who have no kingdoms, we see the signs in the conflict of nations and the saber rattling between superpowers and other nations alike. To many outsiders, island nations in the South Pacific are a tropical paradise, exotic and remote. And yet the focus of intense diplomatic activity from China, part of a Chinese push for influence that's turning the Blue Pacific continent into a zone of geopolitical competition between China and its Western rivals. China's foreign minister has been leading a delegation on a whirlwind 10-day tour across the South Pacific, meeting face-to-face -face or virtually with officials from at least 11 different Pacific Island nations. Most of these countries' entire populations are dwarfed by even a small Chinese city. Don't be too anxious. Don't be too nervous. Because the common development of the prosperity of China and all other developing countries would only mean greater harmony, greater justice, and greater prosperity of the whole world. The last time great powers competed in the South Pacific was World War II, when the U.S. and its allies fought a grinding, island-hopping military campaign against Japan. We see famine just this week it was reported that 19 food processing plants so far this year have burned down or been destroyed. Within the span of the past year, one of the world's largest ships jammed up the Suez Canal for nearly a week. The Suez Canal being one of the world's most important trading routes. The price of fertilizers for crops have hit an all-time high. Bill Gates became the largest farmland owner in the United States. World leaders announced impending food shortages due to the war in Ukraine. With Russia and Ukraine making up more than 30% of the global wheat market, and they're considered the breadbasket of Europe. Followed by reports of the bird flu in the United States over the past month, forcing farmers to kill millions of egg-laying poultry. All of these aforementioned incidents have driven up the price of items at your grocery store. But now we shift our focus to the most recent series of strange events contributing to this price hike and potential shortage. Wondering, is it all a coincidence or something more? In some ways, it's like the ship getting stuck in the Suez was just the start, just the beginning of all these recent supply chain issues. And really, it's only escalated from there. In the last six months, around 20 U.S. food processing facilities have burned down. And that is only in terms of food processing plants. So much engineering is underway to destroy our source of food. Famine, economic distress, ready to collapse. We hear it almost on a daily basis that the economy is just setting on air, and soon it will collapse under the weight of all bad decisions by so-called politicians and servants that have been treasonous in their fiduciary responsibilities and serving the people who have elected them. We see pestilence, or the CVD-19er, 
and the impact that it has had. And, uh, and then there's now the additional plague, if you will. Take a listen to this. The World Health Organization is sounding the alarm on the future of monkeypox. Earlier this week, the organization warned time may be running out to prevent an endemic in countries where the virus is not normally seen. The WHO director general had this to say about the growing risk. The risk of monkeypox becoming established in non-endemic countries is real. It's clearly concerning that monkeypox is spreading in countries where it has not been seen before. It's a concern here in the U.S. too. The number of monkeypox cases has jumped to 35 with four cases identified in the last 24 hours. The CDC has already issued a level two travel alert urging everyone to take extra precautions while on a trip. Let's bring in NBC News medical contributor Dr. Uche Blackstock. Dr. Blackstock is also an emergency medicine physician and the CEO of Advancing Health Equity. Doctor, always good to have you with us. So we've been talking about monkeypox for a little while yeah. now. We should note the numbers are still relatively low, though they're there is growing concern about its spread, but health experts say not too late to contain it. How do we do that? Yeah, so, so absolutely. And what we use are the tried and true public health measures that we know work. Identify people who are infected, contact people who have been in close proximity to them and isolate them. And so all of the same measures that actually worked in the beginning days of the COVID pandemic are going to work uh, for monkeypox. We also need to let people know what symptoms to be aware of, fever, malaise, body aches, um, as well as that uh, traditional rash, uh, a red rash that becomes fluid filled with pustules. And of course we have signs in the area of technology and computer technology in particular that will accommodate the different events that are recorded in the book of Revelation, specifically that no man will be able to buy or sell or get gain without the mark of the beast. This will require nothing short of super computer technology which we know is now available and is in effect. And then, of course, among the other signs, there is the super sign that tells us that summer is near, that spring is about to come to conclusion. And that super sign is none other than Israel, Jerusalem, and the people of God in their God-given land. And so there is replete in this day signs that the scripture tells us are, are likened or compared to the signs of spring that we are seeing the signs that tell us we are in the final throes of the church age Nowhere in scripture is there such specific messaging regarding the sign, signs of the times and giving us clues than the very specific words of the Lord Jesus himself. For example, in Matthew 24 and verse 32, we read, Now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves. You know that Listen to these words, summer is nigh. And again in Mark chapter 13, verses 28 and 29, now learn a parable of the fig tree when her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So ye light in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. And again, the same words, Luke 21, verse 31. So likewise, the Lord Jesus speaking, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Now, the question is, what is the prophecies pointing to that our Lord is speaking of in these three different texts as well as other place. The context is not the rapture. 
He is not speaking of the signs that will accompany the rapture of the church. He's actually speaking of the signs that speak of the coming seven-year tribulation and ultimately the kingdom of God to come to this world. He says, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. And that before the rapture of the church, that which is pertaining to the kingdom of God, that must follow and we must see the world stage setting for the very seven year tribulation. And indeed, it is so clear and vivid to anyone who has an eye to see. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 32, Now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender. Now notice here once again, we are giving clues not only pertaining to the signs, but they're actually providing for us a timeline. When the fig tree, when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. And then he goes on in verse 34, Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Once again, what is it that he's talking about? He is not talking about the rapture of the church. The disciples asked him, When will be the sign of your coming and the coming of the kingdom? So they did not know about 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul had not even been a, a publicly or formally appointed as, a, as an apostle. And then we read also in verse 30, again telling us of what he is talking about. He is talking about, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, verse 30 of Matthew 24. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. By the way, the scripture tells us we'll be with him. At that time, he is talking to the Jews. He is talking to the Israelis who will await that period of time while they're going through the tribulation, Jacob's sorrows and Jacob's troubles for the coming of Messiah when finally he will be revealed to them. But what are we to expect if indeed the Lord is speaking to the generation that will witness these signs, and these signs will point to the coming of God's kingdom and ultimately the Lord coming to the earth and the clouds of glory. But what are we to expect? I believe the Song of Solomon gives us strong prophetic clues. What are we to expect if we read, for example, in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 13, the fig tree putteth forth green figs, and the vines with the tender grape gives a good smell. And the Lord says in the next word, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Backing up to verse 10 of chapter 2 of our text, my beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Again in the 13th verse, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. And so we see in the Song of Solomon a reference to an event that will take place where Solomon is calling the Shulamite woman, the symbol of the Gentile church, to come up and to go away. We are soon going to come up at the word of the Lord, and we're not going to be coming right back down. We're going to be going away to the Father's house. In my Father's house, John 14, the Lord Jesus said, there are many mansions. It is 
And speaking of a type of the Jewish wedding or, or marriage, that we will be going to his father's house. I, speaking from a personal level, have never ever had so much scriptural evidence that speaks to my heart and my mind that we are at the final throes. Through the years, I have always been excited about certain periods of time of the year, particularly as they pertain to the feasts, and always sensing that the rapture could take place at any moment. But so much as I look back in retrospect, I see how that much of my hope was based upon desire rather than enough scriptural prophetic evidence. But today, the opposite is true in terms of my own experience. As much as I desire in my heart to go and to be with the Lord and having great hope in my heart that that shall soon come to pass, there is a preponderance of prophetic evidence, a forensic type of of uh, evidence, if you will, that speaks to me of the fact that we are about to be called up to meet the Lord in the clouds, in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so I found myself through the years always getting excited at certain Jewish feasts. And uh, in particular, the Feast of the Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. Only in the last couple of years have I seen things pertaining to the Feast of Pentecost that seem to suggest and point more to the rapture than the Feast of Trumpets. But let me say something very clearly. There is nothing in my understanding of Bible prophecy that tells me that the rapture of the church must take place on a specific Jewish feast holiday. Having said that, the Lord has already established precedents, and we know that he has fulfilled the first three spring feasts. He has fulfilled Passover. He has fulfilled uh, the Feast of Leaven bre Unleavened Bread. And he has fulfilled First Fruits. But the First Fruits, we have always jumped to the next feast, which would be the Feast of Trumpets as a winter or a fall feast, assuming that the Feast of Pentecost was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. On a personal level, I believe that we are still in the time of, first, of, of the first fruits or Pentecost. The Apostle Peter said in Acts chapter 2, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. What was that? It was the birthing of the church. Jesus being the first fruits, and we who are also part of the first fruits over a period of some 2,000 years until the end when Pentecost, I believe, is spoken of, of Jubilee, when the Lord closes the book. And at that time, I believe we are called up to rise up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, just by way of important note, the Feast of Pentecost this year, according to the Jewish calendar, always having to be on the third month of the 15th day and taking the Jewish calendar, that third month and the 15th day speaks to our sixth month, June 15th. So in just a few days away from now, there will be a celebration, a true, according to the Jewish calendar. Am I excited 
about this upcoming day, personally, I'm thrilled. And I'm excited because I know in my heart of hearts, based upon all the prophetic passages that I am very familiar with and have studied and prayed about over many decades, that we are in the time, we are in the season, we have come through spring and near the end, and the birds are singing, and the flowers are coming up, and there is a fragrance in the air that is nothing short of profoundly exciting. Whether or not the time that we know as Pentecost will be the day of our departure. We cannot say with absolute certainty, as I mentioned a few moments ago. However, there is something that I can say with absolute certainty, that when it happens, and it may very well happen today, tomorrow, or reasonably speaking, and this upcoming Feast of Pentecost, what I can say with absolute certainty, there's going to be a whole lot of deeply, deeply, deeply sorrowful, disappointed, professing Christians. Matthew 25 puts it this way, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And moving up to verse 8, And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, let there be, let, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Verily I say unto you, I know you not, or I never knew you. So the question I just need to, to pose, to posit, if you will, as before we go on, is this. Are you ready? Are you ready I want to just underscore the importance of that. We're going to say a few uh, words regarding being ready uh, in a moment. But there is so much in the balance of eternity that how could we even take a chance? Are you ready? I want to quote from a commentary, a student of Bible prophecy, as, he, as it pertains to Pentecost itself. This is what he says, quote, The church of Jesus Christ is taken off the earth before the time of Jacob's trouble for a whole variety of reasons, but mostly because it's Jacob's trouble, which has nothing to do with the church. Replacement theologists, who are always stealing Israel's blessings, also try to steal their curses by putting the church in the tribulation, but that will not work. He goes on to say, many prophecy experts mistakenly try and put the rapture of the church in the fall at the Feast of Trumpets, but that will not work. The church is connected to the Feast of First Fruits, which takes place at the time of year when spring is melding into summer. Remember, the rapture of the church kicks off with a voice as of a trumpet, not an actual trumpet. And just to comment on that again, we spoke on this on a previous presentation, that the voice of God was as it were of a trumpet when in Revelation chapter 1, where the Lord Jesus is speaking, his voice sounding like a trumpet says, I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end. This is not the blowing of a trumpet. This is the voice of our Solomon saying, come up hither. I believe that with all my heart. Continuing on, he goes on to say, 
After this, I looked and behold, the door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet taking, talking with me and said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. What are those things that must be hereafter? Well, the church, the seven letters, which speaks to the church age has come to a conclusion. And now the things that must happen thereafter and the church is going to be with Solomon or our Solomon, the Lord Jesus Christ, as he says, come up hither. And it is the voice of the beloved calling up his bride. Actual trumpets are reserved for the time of Jacob's trouble where God will once again be dealing with his chosen people, the Jews, unquote. Now, I just want to reiterate which, what I have been very careful to underscore time and time again, that I am not a date setter. I believe that the rapture could literally take place today. And as time progresses, and as I see these different signs unfolding and seeing in clear view the different apocalyptic events that the book of Revelation speaks of will be happening during the great tribulation. More and more, I believe that any moment we can be taken out of here. But if there is to be a feast, a Jewish feast, or should I say a Old Testament feast celebrated, which really is the only one that speaks of a Gentile feast, which is the Feast of Pentecost, for the church consists of Jews and Gentiles alike, the Gentiles being grafted in to the Jewish uh, uh, plant, as it were, or vine. So that the, pen, the celebration of Pentecost is a time where they were to celebrate with leaven bread, two loaves of leavened bread rather than unleavened bread because of the joining of the Jews and Gentiles alike and leaven speaking of Gentiles. And so there is that first fruit celebration that speaks of the Lord's resurrection and then continuing on for a period from the resurrection for a period of 50 days until Pentecost, and that covers that span of time of the church generation. And so if ever there was a time or the, a timeline that the Bible gives us that points to a specific season, it is the text that we have today speaking to us of, as the commentator put it, the spring melding into the summer. Now keep in mind, if we are going to look at the fig tree as representing the, the Jewish nation, then Jesus said that there will be in existence all of that generation before all those signs are completed. Now remember, he's talking about right through the, se the seven-year tribulation to the end and the coming of the Lord and the clouds of glory and him sending out his angels at the end to go and to get the elect or the Jewish people. It isn't the Lord calling them up to meet him in the air and taking them away to heaven and the Father's house, but rather it is the Lord commanding the angels at the end to go out and to gather the elect from the four corners of the earth, which I believe firmly is representative of the Jewish people who have now reached through the seven-year tribulation and the Lord is about to position them alongside of him. Because the Bible tells us that it shall come to pass that all of Israel shall be saved in a day. There is another place that we see another book that also speaks to us of this period of time 
as symbolic to the departure of the church. And we don't have the time to go in to develop this, but it is the book of Ruth. And we know that Ruth represents the Gentile church, whereas Boaz represents the Kingsman Redeemer, represents the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And in the book of Ruth, again, we see the time of the first fruits coming to fruition, coming to the end of the period of 50 days to Pentecost, where the church is, or should I say, where um, Boaz has concluded, they have concluded the gathering of all the wheat and the barley, and now Boaz makes his move to, to secure Ruth, the type of a church, to be his bride. And uh, you can read it. It's a, a beautiful, beautiful account, I believe, of the marriage of the church and being represented by Ruth and Boaz representing the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, getting back off, I, I didn't, I skipped this point right here, that uh, Israel being the blossoming of the fig tree, that uh, this generation will not pass until all these things happen. In Psalm 90 and verse 10, we read that the days of our years are three score years and 10. And if by reason of strength, they be four years four score years or 80 years. We know that Israel was born in uh, 1948 and currently the nation is 74 years old. So someone said, well, that brings us past that point of 80, it brings us to 81. Actually, it doesn't. What we understand in the scripture in terms of the countdown from the time Israel has been born that an 80-year span is to be considered through the 80. We don't conclude at the beginning of 80 or the end of 79. It is through the 80 years, which if we look at that, the rapture of the church of necessity, if we are interpreting that portion of Scripture prophetically correctly, the rapture needs to take place very, very soon, and the great tribulation must commence in a short while, probably being this coming fall. If the timeline that we have, so many of us have believed through the years, is to be an accurate interpretation. And there are some who say that uh, we may be off a year or two because of the rounding of the years. But that, to me, personally, I believe that the year 2022, all eyes are toward 2022. And so getting back again to uh, Ruth as a example of the church, symbolically speaking, that uh, being joined to kinsman redeemer at the end of the harvest of barley and wheat, and then our text as well with the Song of Solomon, they are both pointing to this very, very time frame that we're in right now. Nothing is written in stone, and we have stated that, but what we do know is this, the time has come. What I do believe is written in stone is the season. We can know the season, and we are in the season. And currently, I am waiting for my Lord and my Savior to come to pierce the I believe eastern skies, a portal is going to be open and the Lord Jesus is going to descend from heaven along with all the saints that have gone before us and the Lord is going to call up the physical bodies of those saints to join with them for their eternal bodies and almost simultaneously we who are alive and remain shall be changed 
from mortal to immortal, and caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I believe that we are about to hear our Savior's voice, as it were, of a trumpet, saying, as our text states, Arise, my love, my fair one, verse 13 of the Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Or in verse 10, My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my fair one, and come away. And where are we going to our Father's house. That is the promise that our Lord made. He has made a very, very serious promise to those of us who have put our trust in Him and who consider His promises as precious and unalterable. We are waiting for Him to fulfill His words of promise. He said, heaven and earth will pass away but my words, they shall never pass away. He is about to undertake in one of the most spectacular events, almost unimaginable, if it were not for the fact that it is clearly written in the Word of God, and the Word of God is clearly inspired by God, if it weren't for it being written in the Word of God, well, I guess I would say it like uh, Chuck Missler, who has now gone to be with the Lord. It is preposterous to even think that in one moment we're going to be changed from corruptible into incorruptible, but for the sake, the Word of God said it, and therefore we believe it. And the Lord keeps his word. And we know that the precedent has already been set. And Jesus, our first fruits, even as he was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, at the conclusion of his atoning love, he bore our sins, took our place, and then he ascended as the first fruits. And now he is waiting for the completion of the first fruits, which is the church, the bride. Bottom line is, I am personally not wait, waiting for the undertaker. We who understand the word of God and who are truly dispensationalists, who believe that God deals with epochs of time, both in terms of with the Gentiles for the last 2,000 years and then the conclusion of the church, Daniel's 70th week, we believe that we are soon going to see the upper taker. Hallelujah. Soon the Middle Eastern sky, I believe there's even a passage of scripture that speaks to the Middle Eastern sky of the rapture, very possible. And you can read it in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 12 through 16. And I read just from the 14th verse, it says, and the Lord shall be seen over them. He is speaking of the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. And his arrow shall go forth as the lightning, and the Lord God shall blow the trumpet and shall go with whirlwinds of the south. It may very well be speaking that there's going to be a brief glimpse of the glory as the church is taken home. We don't know for sure, but what we do know, we are soon going home. Now, I see my time is coming to an end, but I just want to say a couple more very important words. I know, and I say what I'm about to say with genuine sadness and sorrow for those who are waiting for the changing of the guards. There are millions of professing Christians who are actually believing that there is going to be a political shifting and that a man whose, whose policies and principles are consistent with the word of God, possibly our 45th or another, and certainly a changing of the guards as far as, as the politicians go and the, and the government goes, that there are those 
who are waiting for that shifting to come. And they are envisioning a moment when justice is going to prevail and where these who perpetrate this, this heinous crimes against humanity that we're seeing are going to be brought to justice. And they even talk about various different sealed warrants that are going to be executed. And I am so troubled when I listen to them and their programs and, and their popular programs, and they virtually never even mention that Jesus is coming back to this world. And it's mind boggling to see that scripture has virtually almost one third speaking of Bible prophecy and specifically of this day. And nothing is mentioned. And instead they talk about a shifting of the guards. And again, I understand the burden of the heart toward these who are perpetrating terrible atrocities against humanity. These politicians on both sides of the aisle who have violated their oath of, of commitment to protect those that put them in office. Instead, they are selling their souls for a bowl of porridge and that being to the expense of their fulfilling their obligation. I understand why one would want to see justice, but that is what God is going to do. And the scripture is replete with prophecies in Isaiah and in Jeremiah specifically and other places where God is about to deal with these perpetrators, these oligarchs and all the alike who think that they could just crush God's people and humanity and never be held accountable. But that is God's position. There is something far greater to be excited about in our lives than that of a possible shifting of an administration or a changing of the guards. And that is the true implementation of the government of God in that Jesus Christ must first return back to this world and establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. If there is any that's listening to my voice right now and you are being told about Israel no longer being uh, recognized in the sight of God and that Israel represents the church today, that is from the pit of hell. There are too many specific promises that God gave to Israel, and if he is about to violate all those promises, then we don't have a leg to stand on when it comes to trusting in the promises of God that he gives to us, the church, particularly John 14. To come, he said, and he's going to take us home where his father's house has many mansions, and on and on and on. And I do not see my Savior dragging his beloved bride through a period of world history. The Bible speaks of more horrific, more bloody, more depopulation, more suffering than any other time of all world history. And we can look in history and see some atrocities that have been committed on large, broad scale. And yes, Jesus said that what is going to take place during the last days when there will ultimately be an establishment of, a, of another third temple, and that according to Daniel, there will be the setting up of the abomination of desolation, that that period of time will be by way of its atrocity and its horror and its suffering and its abomination second to none. And to think that some would suggest that our Lord is going to drag his bride through that time is an insult to his goodness, his character, his love, his faithfulness, his promises, that he said, we are not appointed unto wrath, but unto salvation. And the scripture has so many, and we have this for another day. And I, for one, I am not looking forward to a new government, a new uh, changing of the guards. As for me, I am tired of fake news 
of lies, of fake presidents and fake politicians who say they are for you when they are lying through their teeth. As for me and my house, we will trust in the name of the Lord. You see, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we must remember the name of the Lord our God. And his name is reflective of who he is. He is our savior. He is our redeemer. He is our protector. He is our all in all. He is our righteousness. If you're struggling with personal guilt and condemnation, you need to remember the name of the Lord, your God. His name is the Lord, our righteousness. You see, it's time for us to leave the things of this world, the entanglements, the disappointments, the heartaches, the fake governments, the fake lies that are being spewed out by our fake media. And we need to take to heart the word of the Lord. Remember this world is passing away. And God says that we are to put our faith. Love not the world, he said, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, all, not most, all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, these things are not of God, beloved. They are of the world. And the world perisheth in all the things that are in this world. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 17. Our Savior is speaking loudly to our hearts today. He is saying to his beloved, look up for your redemption draws nigh even at the door. Hallelujah. And now I just want to take a moment and speak to those of you who you're not ready. At least you don't think you're ready to meet the Lord. You're, not, you're going to be left behind. And if you choose to, if you imagine that you're going to decide to, to put your trust in the Lord and lay down your body to the point of have, being decapitated, well, you are naive. Now, I know there are going to be many that are going to be saved during the tribulation. The tribulation saints, these are not the church. The church will have already been gone, completed. There will be a period of time of seven years, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Those that get saved during the seven-year tribulation, understand, that's not part of the bride of Christ. They will inherit the kingdom of God also. But only now, until the end, until he finally calls us home and we go to glory and we are truly united with the Lord Jesus through marriage. And that's where we are at. And the question is, are you ready? If you are not ready, if you're not sure, in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray with me. This is the thing that we do each week. As long as God gives us breath, he gives us a platform, we are going to extend an invitation to all of you who will come. The Lord says, come. He bids you come. He says he gives a gift, an unspeakable gift, but you must come and you must receive it. And this is how you receive it, through putting your faith in his atonement, acknowledging with your mouth and your heart that you are a wretched, wretched sinner and that you need forgiveness and you need a savior. And that person is the son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're ready to do that, then pray this prayer with me and repeat these words. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you this day and I confess to you that I am a sinner and that I need forgiveness. And this day I ask of you, please forgive me. Wash away my sins through the precious blood of Jesus. 
according to your word, you said if I would believe in you, whosoever it is that believes in you should not perish, but have everlasting life. According to John chapter 3 and verse 16. Today, Lord, I believe and I confess. I believe in Jesus. I believe in his death. I believe in his burial. And I believe in his resurrection. And I open my heart. And I invite you this day. Please come into my heart by your Holy Spirit and make me your child. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are numbered among the most blessed, richest of all God's creation. The Lord has become your exceedingly great reward. And I personally welcome you to the family of God. Take some time each day, read the word, pray. You know, the Bible tells us we are to watch and we're to pray. I don't believe the Lord said just do 50%. I believe it's imperative for us to spend some time each day in prayer. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith and faith alone in him. But if we are saved and we love the Lord and it's in our heart, then we're going to spend some time each day with him, if but for a few moments talking with him. I encourage you to do that. We are living, as the scripture says, in perilous, perilous times. And if I were to create an analogy that speaks to that which we are experiencing as believers today, I would paint a picture of the saints in a ship, not unlike that of the apostles. And we're in raging seas. We are in a storm that is wanting our very own lives. And we are on this ship and we are being tossed about by waves. And it seems almost as if our ship is being filled and that ahead of us in the darkness, there awaits sharp rocks protruding the surface. And so we don't know when we're gonna hit those rocks or if we're just going to sink because we're being flooded by the raging sea until we see Jesus like the apostles who were on that ship and they saw him and when they saw him they said lord is that you and he said it is i and peter said lord if it's you bid me come and the lord said come peter and he came and i see that moment there and as i equate it to where we are in these perilous times I see Jesus as the light in the harbor that shines the way for us to journey through safe passage to the other side. And that is what my daughter and I are going to sing about in the next few moments. And I want to thank you for all your encouragements and how you share so often and being blessed by our ministry of music. And I must say, of all the moments and preparations and, and delivery, that which brings me to tears more often than any other is when I listen to the music and the songs that God gives us. They're so simple, no big production, but there is an anointing there. And I trust you will be blessed today as you receive the word of God by way of music. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you listen.
There's a lighthouse on a hillside that overlooks life scene. When I'm tossed about, it sends out a light that I might plainly see. And the light that shines in the darkness now It will safely lead me home If it wasn't for that lighthouse Then this ship would be no more And I thank God for the lighthouse I owe my life to Him Yes, Jesus is the lighthouse Over the rocks, the rocks of sin And He has shown a light Until that moment, 
Maranatha, my friends. Jesus, he is coming. He is coming soon. Amen, amen, and amen. <laughs>